I titled this message, Resurrection was for restoration of the image of God. Resurrection was for the restoration of the image of God. So let, let's look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Genesis 1, 26, and it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. The word image there is resemblance. Let us make man to resemble us according to our likeness. And that word likeness is like as. So God said, let us make man to resemble us and to make him like us. In Psalms 8 verse 5, David said, that God crowned man with glory and honor. You don't have to go to that scripture. He said that God, David, David put it this way. I, I, I can imagine what David was doing. That one day David was just looking up into the heavens. And he, he said, and when I look into the heavens and I see the stars, I see all the works of your hand, how beautiful. Like we, we in Toronto, we don't really get to see the stars. I remember as a child in Jamaica that I would look up into the sky. You see so many stars in the sky. And you, to really see the stars, you have to go up north. You got to get away from the lights of Toronto. And so I can imagine David looking up into the heavens and he, he says, when I see the stars and, and I see all the works of your hands and everything that you made, he said, what is man? Like, who are we? Like, who are we really? What is man that, you, that you're mindful of him? That, he's, that we're on your mind? And he says, who is this child of a man that you even consider him? That you're even thinking about him? For he says, for you made him. Now in the King James, it says, you made him a little lower than the angels. But the Hebrew word there is you made him a little lower than the Elohim. And that's significant because when it says in Genesis, then God said, the word God there is Elohim. And it says, then Elohim said, let us make man. Elohim is a plural word in the Hebrew. And so it's, it said, and Elohim said, let us make man. And David said that you, that you made him a little lower than the Elohim. So God made man a little lower than himself. Now there's a lot of people out there telling people that, you know, you're a God. Uh, I don't know what kind of God you are and you die. I don't know what kind of God you are and you get sick. Man cannot be God. God is creator. God is from everlasting. He had no beginning and no end. So it's not possible for man to be God. It's impossible. God could not make man God. Because the moment God made him, he couldn't be God. So it's impossible for man to be God. It's not, it cannot happen. It cannot. C-A-N-N-O-T. It cannot. So you got people on YouTube and people are watching these people saying they are God and telling each other they are God. What kind of God are you and you die? What kind of God are you and you are aging? He's from everlasting to everlasting. He has no beginning, no ending. And so David says, who are we? Who is man? Who are we, God? Who are, who are we really? For you made us a little lower than yourself. And he says, you crowned him with glory and honor. That word crown means to encircle. Now, remember, he made them naked. But they were clothed. They were clothed in his glory. And that's why when Adam said, I was naked and ashamed, God said, who told you you were naked? 
So if a man never sinned, we'd all be walking around naked. <laughs> but we wouldn't be mindful of it. But because we lost that glory, we are now clothed. And our glory becomes our clothes. That's why, you know, those of us who like to dress up, dress up. And he said, you made him to have dominion. You made him to have dominion. Now, in the, in, the, in the scripture says, he said, let them have dominion. But David said, you made him to have dominion. We were created to have dominion. We were created to rule over all that God. He said, and you made him to have dominion. And you crowned him with glory and honor. And you put all things under his feet. And Dave, uh, Paul puts it this way. There was nothing that was not put under him. I want you to know the angels were subject to man. Everything, the only being in the universe that was not subject to God was, excuse me, the only being in the universe that was not subject to man was God himself. But everything in the universe was subject to humanity. He said, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. It's, it's hard for us to imagine it because we don't see it. But if we want to know what Adam was like, we look at Jesus. If you want to know what life would have been like, what humanity would have been like without us having disobeyed God, look at Jesus. Jesus spoke to the tree and it obeyed him. Jesus spoke to the wind and the sea and it obeyed him. Jesus spoke to sickness and disease and obeyed him. Jesus walked on water. Everything in the universe, when we see Jesus, when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see what man was supposed to be. You see how we were supposed to live. Jesus never got sick. Did Jesus cry? Yes. See, ooh. please don't stone me. I'm not trying to be sacrilegious. But did Jesus use the washroom? Yes, he did. Sacrilege. You know? <laughs> The Bible says he was tempted in every which way we were. He was tempted with homosexuality. He was tempted with fornication. Jesus was tempted to lie and cheat and to cuss. Yes, Jesus was tempted to cuss. He was tempted in every single way we were. But he says, was without sin. I want you to know again, please don't stone me, but Jesus was not perfect in the way we think of perfection. Because when we think of perfection, we say that a person is perfect. And when we think of perfection, we think of incapable of making a mistake. And if Jesus was incapable of making a mistake, he could not represent us. How can you tempt somebody that cannot sin? It is not a temptation. Because if I cannot do it, how can you tempt me to do it? It says he is not a high priest that's not touched with our weaknesses, with our infirmities. Everything that we experience, all the hurt, all the heartaches, all the betrayal, everything that we, we as human beings feel that cause us pain and hurt, he was touched by it. Because if he wasn't touched by it, he could not be our high priest. See, we limit the wounds to the wounds on the tree. But when it says by his wounds we were healed, we're not just talking about the physical wounds. He says, I was, it says, I was wounded in the house of my friend. My own familiar friend, he wounded me. Why? Because he betrayed me. I want to 
want you to know what Judas did wounded Jesus. How many of you know that wound of betrayal? Jesus knew that wound. It wasn't just his physical wound because they, if it was just his physical wound, then he could only heal us physically. But he knows heart wound. He knows what it is to be betrayed. He knows what it's like to put to trust somebody. He says, listen, they slept in the same place. They walked together. They laughed together. They ate together. I was wounded in the house of my friends. My own for familiar friend. He wounded me. I want you to know that when man sinned, when man rebelled against God, he lost the image of God. He lost his dominion over all things. He lost it. I want to define sin again for us. Sin is that desire that we have that causes us to do things at the expense of other people. Even at the expense of ourselves. I want it another way. Sin is that desire that causes us to do things to hurt others or even hurt ourselves. That's what sin is. That's why all the law hangs on two commandments. You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And you shall love your neighbor as you do what? Love yourself. And it says love is the fulfillment of the law. Why? Because love harms no one. Isn't it very interesting that the people we hurt the most are the people we say we love? Don't you find that very interesting? That the people we hurt the most is the people that have opened up their heart to us. The people we have opened up ourselves to is, is, is the people we hurt the most. Love does no harm to his neighbor. And that, the Bible says in, in John chapter, uh, uh, excuse me, 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, uh, uh, 17, it says, God is love. And it says, as he is, so are we in the world. We're supposed to be loved. And then we have to ask ourselves a question. Every decision we make and what we do, is this from a place of love? Because as he is, so are we in the world. Is it from a place of love? I want you to know that even though I love my wife, but a lot of times when we talk about love, we're talking about eros love. And not the love of God, which is agape love or agape love. And what is the difference? Agape love wills good all the time. Eros love, I love you because I'm attracted to you. I love you because you make me feel good. That's why I love you. I want you to know that love is not enough. The love that I love you because you make me feel good doesn't stop me from hurting you. It doesn't. Have I done things to hurt my wife? Have I done things to hurt my wife? <laughs> Diane says, I don't know. <laughs> yes, I have. Any husband, or if, if I was to ask any husband, have you done stuff to hurt your wife? And he says, no, I know he's a liar. He's a liar. He's lying. <laughs> if I ask a wife, says, have you done something to hurt your husband? And she says, no, she's lying. Why? Because we're imperfect beings. We are imperfect beings. I want you to know when Adam sinned, he wronged God. And God was angry. What do
do people do when you wrong them and they're angry with you? What do they? No, 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 revenge. They separate themselves from you. They separate themselves from you. Husband and wife turn their back to each other. Now I mean, some of them go to the next room. <laughs> They go sleep in the next room. Now, just a marriage counseling note here. One of the things I tell couples is this. That is an absolute no-no. You never go sleep in another room. Never. And you don't turn your back to each other unless it's time to go to sleep. Now, my wife knows time to go to sleep. I kiss her goodnight and I turn my back. Because I don't know, psychologically, for some reason, it's hard for me to go to sleep facing her. I don't know what the issue is. <laughs> she knows the routine. I pray for her, I kiss her goodnight, and I turn my back. Not because I'm angry, but for some psychological reason. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I'm trying to figure it out as to why I can't sleep facing her. I tried it. And I said, look, I need to sleep. <laughs> ben says she's too distracting. <laughs> now, I wish that was it, but no. Nah. But I, I'm not even trying to figure out. I need to sleep. I turn my back. But, but, we, but the, that's what the devil does for separating. But I want you to know, I want us to get this point, that when we wrong somebody, they get angry and they separate themselves. I want you to know that God separated himself from man. Why? Because man separated and disobeyed God and God was angry with what Adam did. And he separated himself from, from Adam. You know why he was angry? He was angry with what Adam did. Because what Adam did Change the whole course of God's plan. <laughs> he changed, and listen to me, what Adam did not only affected the earth, it affected the entire universe. Changed everything. And I want you to know that man, when Adam sinned, went from the very image and likeness of God to a flawed image. Now understand, we never stopped being the image of God, but we were now broken and flawed. Now when I stand in front of a mirror, and I look into the mirror, I see myself. But if I take a hammer and smash the mirror, and it all smashed, and, and you know those all these distorting the thing, is it still a reflection of my image? Is it still a reflection of my image? Yes. But it's a broken image. And guess what? It's untouchable. Because if I touch that image, it will cut me. Did you get what I said? Did you just get what I said? When you touch a broken image, it will cut you. And that's why we cut each other. Because we went from being the pure image and likeness of God to a broken, flawed image. And guess what? Broken people break people. Broken people break people. Another marriage counseling moment. Don't get into a relationship to fix anybody. Because you can't. Marriage 101. Marriage is like money. What do you mean? People say money changes people. No, it does not. Money magnifies people. Whatever you are, money will just make it more. See, he changed when he got money. No, he did not. Money just magnified all that was there already. Good news for you. Marriage magnifies what was already there. 
People, I got married and he changed. No, he did not. <laughs> it just magnified what he was. Oh, I got married to her and she changed. No, she did not. Whatever you see before the relationship, just take it to a thousandth degree. And people went, I don't know what happened. <laughs> Whatever someone shows you they are, believe it. I don't know why the Lord has me on this. But I'm going to go there. <laughs> Don't deceive people in relationship. Don't deceive people. Show them who you are. Let them know who you are. And if they can't deal with who you are, they're not for you. I had a conversation with one of my sons yesterday, and he started taking notes from daddy. <laughs> but the thing is, you know, he was saying he's really concerned. You know, he's my youngest son, and, and he's got a really good head on his shoulders in regards to certain things. One of the things is money. And it, I, I didn't know this because, you know, he informs me of these things. He said there's this 50-50 thing, um, you know, where now there's women out there. So he's like, I said, Dad, I don't know what I'm going to do. He said, because there are women out there, they just they figure you're in a relationship and the guy is supposed to take care of everything. I said, what do you mean, son? I, I, I said, do you mean that if you, you know, take a woman out on a date or you go out, you pay for it as a man? He goes, no, no that's not what I mean. Because my sons know what, what that is. Men, men listen, one-on-one. You take a woman out on a date, you pay for it. There's no thing going Dutch. There's no 50 split in the bill. If you can't afford the dinner, don't take her. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Right? There's no 50-50 business here. You take the woman out, you pay for the dinner. You go to Tim Hortons, you pay for it. You go to Mickey D's, you pay for it. You go get ice cream, you pay for it. If you can't afford the woman, if you can't afford to have a woman in your life, don't have a woman in your life. But he said, no, 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 that, 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 no, no that's not what I mean, Dad. There are women out there that if you're in a relationship with them, they expect you to take care of them. I go, and you're not married? No, no, that is, you know, they, you know, they figure if they want stuff, you go buy it. Relationship 101. We're not married. You want a purse? It's the only way you're going to get a purse is your birthday or Christmas. But if you want to, if you, if, if you want in between that time, you want a purse, go buy yourself a purse. If you want a dress, go buy yourself a dress. Why? Because we ain't like that. I don't have a financial responsibility for you until we say I do. Until we say I do, I have no financial obligation to you. I acknowledge you on your birthday because I say I love you. I acknowledge you at Christmas time because I say I love you. But in between that, if I choose to give you a gift, I give it to you because I love you. But if there's an expectation because we're in a relationship that I need to take care of you, you got to go find somebody else. It's quiet in here. I have no financial responsibility to take care of any woman that I'm not married to. None. And a woman has no financial responsibility to be taking care of a man that you're not married to. Don't lend him any money.
I said, don't lend him any money. <laughs> you, I guess you've been hanging with the wrong woman. But understand, understand, until you're married, you have no financial responsibility to each other. And that's why people get in trouble. And people go and buy homes together, and they're not married. They put their names on cars together, and they're not married. And they wonder, you know, saying, don't go breaking my heart. Are you setting yourself for a broken heart? Don't do it. Again, if you're not married, men, if you're not married to a woman, you have no financial responsibility to her at all. Unless you're taking her out on for dinner. Then it's your women, if a guy takes you out on a date and he says, So are you gonna um split the bill? Get up and leave. <laughs> <laughs> I guess just <laughs> I guess you're going to be washing dishes tonight understand folks that love does no harm and love doesn't use people and so women Men are not sugar daddies. They're not your sugar daddy. Right? Men were not put on the earth to take care of women they are not married to and are not their daughters. And women were not put on the earth to take care of men that lies around on the couch. Love does no harm. Love is the image of God. And you know what? It's interesting that people will say, Amen. Yes, Pastor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. But you don't check yourself. You need to check yourself. I'm, I, I have to constantly check myself. Constantly check myself. Why? Because we, our tendency is to be selfish, to think about ourselves first and sometimes only. And we end up hurting the people we say we love. And why is that? Because the image got flawed. The image got broken. The image got flawed. The image got broken. The image got flawed. The image got broken. Do you know what Jesus said? I'm going to have to continue this message in my life. I have to wind it up. But Jesus said he came to heal the broken hearted. We got flawed. We got broken. It's still the same image in the mirror. But it's broken. And if you touch it, you get cut. And that's what we do. I've cut my wife many times. Not physically, you know what I mean. I've got to put that on tape. <laughs> Go on YouTube back and he did what? <laughs> I've cut my wife many times. And she has cut me many times. She has hurt me many times. But you know the good news is, as the years go by, we cut each other less. Now some of you got cut so bad you had to leave. Or you bleed to death. Right? But understand, until you first recognize there's a flaw, you can't fix it. Until you recognize there's a brokenness, it can't be fixed. See, because if you won't recognize that the mirror is broken, you won't ever fix it. It's like some of us who have a car, you know, when you get that little speck in the windshield, and you just leave it, and you keep driving, <laughs> and then it gets bigger <laughs> and bigger. And 
Now, how many of you seen people driving with full out crack right across the mirror? Now that's dangerous. Very dangerous. But understand, we get comfortable with brokenness. And the, this is the problem. When you get comfortable with brokenness, you will link up with broken people. When you get comfortable with brokenness, you will hook up with broken people. And when you hook up with broken people, they'll break you. And if you hook up with broke people, they'll make you broke too. And if you hook up with someone with a broke mindset, no matter how much money you make, they can pull you down to their broke state. They gonna pull you down. <laughs> I'll close with this. <laughs> Saying, Pastor, you hard. But I said to my son, please don't get offended with me, please. You, you, you love me, right? You don't even know what I'm about to say, but I'm setting you up. You love me. I said to my son, I said, when you see a woman you're interested in, I want you to ask her three questions. I'll start in the reverse order. I said, one, you need to ask her. You don't tell her what you think. You need to ask her. I said, how often do you think you should have sex? Just, you know, just, and then she'll probably say, well, how often do you think? And you said, no, I want to know how often you think is a healthy, right? And if she's comfortable with once a month or twice a month, it ain't going to work. I'll leave that one alone for you. And then I said, other thing, do they give silent treatments? If they go quiet and shut down and don't talk, he said, well, that within three months, I'll know that. Number one, the first thing, you need to say, and this will be the breaker. I want to see if we're going to be together to take the next step. I want to see your credit score. I want to see your bank transactions because I'm going to show you mine. And I'm going to show you my credit score. You know, please don't get upset with me. <laughs> I said the credit score and your bank transaction. I want to see how you spend money. I want to see how you spend money. And I want to see your credit score. And I want to see how much debt you got and how you're dealing with it. Now watch this. Please, I'm not trying to be cruel. But women will take their clothes off and allow a man to go into them. But I'm telling you, that financial piece, You're willing to go you make yourself physically naked and allow a man to see your nakedness and go inside of you. But you know what will be the icebreaker? I want to see how you spend your money. That is going, and, and that has to be do or die because of a person that will cause so much problem. And woman, you're going to ask the man the same thing. I want to see your credit score. I don't want to see your bank transactions. <laughs> now she's going deep and she says, I want to see a, a, a criminal search. <laughs> she said, I want to see if you have a criminal record. It could be a pedophile. I don't know. I, but I'm, I'm serious. The, 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 thing, the thing is, to understand, because 
we have been broken and we've been flawed. You've got to identify the brokenness and the flaws in the people you connect with and ask yourself, can I live with this? And so if you say, I can live with it, don't complain. When it blows up in your face, don't complain. When they show you who they are, don't complain and say, I want to divorce you. I showed you who I was. I told you who I was. And you still accepted me in my brokenness. Why can't you still accept me and help me heal? Because if you accept me in my brokenness, then you take on the responsibility to help me heal. But to accept me in my brokenness and then take my brokenness and throw it back in my face, you are the one with the problem, not me. Understand, we're not perfect. And if you're waiting for that perfect person, you're not perfect. And the cause of most of the pain and the wounds in our lives is the people we let into our lives. I want you to know that every relationship is going to wound you in some way. If someone says to you, you know what, I will never do anything to wound you, run. Please run away from them. Because they're lying to you. Any relationship. Uh, well, some of them, like family relations, you can only run so far. They're family. Right? <laughs> but I'm talking more about, because I, I have family. But my family don't have my heart like how you have my heart. My family can't hurt me like how you can hurt me. Right? Because I gave you my heart. <laughs> right? So I have family. But they can't hurt me like how you can hurt me. They can't wound me like how you can wound me. So it's different. And that's the wound, because that's the wound that cuts deep. When you give your heart to somebody and they rip it out and throw it aside like it's nothing, that hurts. And for some folks, they can't even recover from that. They can't recover from that. And that's why Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. And you've got to allow Jesus to heal you. Aren't you glad we're led by the Spirit of God? Because that was not my message today. I was talking about resurrection. <laughs> I don't know what to call this now. <laughs> Father, we thank you.